Um, okay, so today I will be analyzing some games that have been submitted to our Patreon page. Um, what we've been doing for the last couple months. Um, this used to be Jesse's monthly show where he would analyze games. Then we moved it on to uh, Patreon at a specific game analysis tier um, where we invite people to submit their annotated classical games uh, that we then review. Um, so we were doing YouTube videos for a while. Um, and now I'm going to try to actually just get through a couple uh, today on stream. And I think I'm just going to make this a regular thing where I'll actually just stream the game analysis and then that will eventually go on YouTube um, as well for anyone that, that misses the original stream. Um, so today I'm going to be uh, showing three games. And I think I'll end up doing these streams probably weekly, like once a week, I'll go through a couple of games because um, we're actually a little bit behind. These games are from November that they were submitted um, that I'm going to be looking at today. And um, yeah, it's going to be some interesting, uh, definitely some interesting stuff. It's always a variety of levels um, in terms of the play that get uh, submitted. Um, but, uh, usually when I go through these games, there's always like something instructive for, uh, for everyone. Um, yeah, if you're interested in checking out the, the Patreon, uh, the link is in, uh, the chat, patreon.com slash chess dojo. It's going to be the game analysis tier. Um, a lot of times it's full. I don't know if it's full right now or not, but it does fill up pretty quickly. Um, but, uh, yeah, only, uh, well, limited number of these that we can do every single month, of course, because um, uh, they do take up uh, a good chunk of time. Um, but uh, again, I ho my hope is that they are uh, not just instructive for the person submitting the game, but also for everyone else that gets to like, watch the, uh, the game analysis too. Um, okay, so let me actually get into the first game. Um, okay, so this game was submitted by... Uh, Lost Soul 9, who's playing white here, and uh, I'm actually not sure about the time control of this game, so for the, for the next time, definitely uh, include, make sure to include the time control so we kind of know what uh, the game was like, and I'm actually not sure about Lost Soul's rating either, um, but they mentioned that their opponent was uh, CM, so Candidate Master, um, and uh, yeah, this game starts off with A3, and the annotations here, uh, it's written that uh, this started as a joke, but then I fell in love with it. So this is, uh, I guess, Lost Souls pet uh, opening. A3 actually is not a totally unreasonable move. It's essentially like you get to play black, but with an extra move A6, which is actually quite useful in a lot of openings. So white can make use of this move um, in, uh, in uh, the eventual middle game. So the game goes knight of six, knight of three, and okay, we don't get a particularly theoretical opening, but both sides start developing uh, their pieces. And um, yeah, eventually we actually get something that looks like a pretty normal d4 opening. So white eventually plays like e3 and uh, d4. Now black plays knight d7, white plays knight c3, and b6. So black setup actually kind of looks... Uh, very typical, almost like uh, some kind of hedgehog. But um, honestly, I feel like black could definitely fight for more space. And I would suggest fighting for more space out of the opening. So um, I feel like if black is maybe going for this kind of setup, then it makes a lot of sense to put the pawn on d5 and get a little bit more control over the center. Because in the game after d4, knight d7, uh, knight c3, black plays b6. If I was white, I would actually go ahead and just play e4 immediately, just take that space. Um, because there's no clear way for black to, to really punish white here. Like bishop b7, we're playing queen to c2, and just holding on to the pawn. And if you have a very nice space advantage and a big center and it's well defended, then I think white gets uh, a big, big advantage right from the start. So it definitely feels like the players weren't respecting the center too much here, because white does end up playing this one, but much, much later ends up going bishop e2, and uh, the note states here, they chose bishop e2 because they felt like bishop d3 was riskier. Probably doesn't make too much of a difference. I feel like the bishop is well developed on either of these squares, but yeah, in, in this exact position, I don't know, bishop d3 somehow feels better just to, again, fight for this key e4 square. Because white would like to play e4, again, gain space, 
and taking a lot of space can definitely be considered like I think a pretty uh, serious advantage out of the opening. Um, anyway, we get bishop e2, bishop b7, b4, and um, logical move just developing uh, the bishop to b2, gaining a little bit of space on the queen side. Um, and then there's a funny note here that I, I've seen before in other annotations, and it says, I didn't want to castle until my opponent castles. And I imagine a lot of people will follow this kind of principle, which I remember thinking as a kid made a lot of sense, but eventually I, I grew out of it. And I think most players eventually uh, grow out of this one because, okay, you're a little bit worried. You don't know where the opponent is going to castle, but you know ultimately you should just figure out where your king is going to be best placed. In most positions, like it's going to be, you know, you have a choice between castling king side and castling queen side. Usually one of those is going to be clearly better than the other, regardless of where the opponent castles. Um, in this case, you know, white's king probably should just go king side, right? Like it's very unlikely that white will want to castle queen side. You could do it, but well, we've already committed a lot of space here, right? So these pawns would be very exposed and it would be quite easy for black to start fighting for counterplay on the queen side. So white's king is going to be much, much safer and definitely belongs on the king side. And in many openings, the king should just be castle king side just because of the way things are set up. That's because in the opening stage, like, you know, when you're playing d4, c4, if the center gets opened up, it's just very risky to castle queen side. And you're not going to do it, you know, regardless of where the opponent is going to castle. So long story short, you should just think about where your king is best. And we shouldn't be worried that if black is going to leave their king in the center or like a castle queen side, white's position is fine no matter what. Not that this is a, a bad move here, just the logic behind it, I think, is a little bit uh, questionable. And yeah, it should be said that castling here would be an absolutely normal move. And white shouldn't fear any kind of like h6, g5, anything like this. Sure, black can always play like this and, and take a huge amount of risk. But, um, you know, we should be willing to accept this fight and believe in... in in castling, right? <laughs> it's like if you believe that your king is safe and, and that castling is a good thing, you should be willing to defend it and then fight back, strike back in the center and create counterplay uh, against the uh, enemy king. But playing scared and like, you know, not castling until the opponent castles, I think this is um, not a great, not a great long-term strategy. Um, anyway, so b4, black castles, because of course black Black doesn't have a lot of space, right? So there's not, not really a lot they can do. They gotta castle their king. Now white castles, of course. Uh, a6, bishop b2, rook e8. And like, it feels like black is playing fine. Like every move seems to have a purpose. Um, but there's a, a key thing that hasn't happened here. Black still hasn't played this move c5 and, and fought for any space whatsoever. So now white plays queen c2. Uh, takes control over the e4 square, and then bishop f8, e4, and now white has seized a very, very nice uh, space advantage. So this early part of the game, okay, white's play could have been improved a bit, but yeah, at some point black really needed to play a move like knight e4, pretty much at any point, just to kind of fight for more space, maybe f5, maybe knight df 6 This is the typical way you play this kind of like, you know, Queen's Indian setup. You have to try to control this square. If white wins the battle, as it happens after rook e8, queen c2, uh, and white could have, of course, played e4 earlier, then white just gets a big, big advantage here. And uh, yeah, from white's point of view, definitely um, they could have gone queen c2 earlier. This would have been a good move at any point to take control over the e4 square. Absolutely. Um, and in many openings, you do kind of see this kind of subtlety where white plays like queen c2 before castling, not because they're afraid to castle, but because queen c2 is a very important move taking control of this square before black has a chance to play knight e4. Um, so uh, finally, white does get e4 in and now is doing great. Uh, black plays h6, and black's position looks very solid, but the issue is no space. White is just uh, putting on a big squeeze here. Um, and now e5, and uh, nothing wrong with this move. If anything, maybe it's a little bit early. White could also continue building up with moves like rook ad1, rook fe1, bishop d3, uh, and so on. But e5 is, is absolutely fine. Black plays knight h7. And uh, now white goes h4, trying to stop knight to g5. Maybe not necessary, but I think white at this point actually has a lot of leeway here and can do uh, a number of things. Uh, here black goes f5. 
And finally, Black starts fighting at least for a little bit uh, of space. Um, White continues building up, rook ad1. Um, a pretty typical idea, actually, I just wanted to mention in these types of positions, like for d4 players specifically, I think this one is pretty useful. When the opponent has played f5 specifically, and this move often weakens the light squares, you do want to look out for this like d5 break. So in this case, maybe something like taking and then breaking with d5, I think would have been would have been pretty strong. And of course, it's no coincidence that you know e6 is now falling, f5 is a target, and yeah, basically black's position is kind of falling apart on the light squares. Uh, so if ed5, probably something like queen takes f5, and then if takes, we have bishop takes with check. And yeah, white's position just looks uh, very, very nice. You know, these bishops are super strong. Um, so this is a nice a nice break to keep in mind. It comes up all kinds of like Nimzo, Queen's Indian type of positions, especially when the opponent has played f5 because yeah, we're just cracking um, black's position on, on the light squares here. Um, so I just wanted to point out that idea, but rook ad1 uh, feels like a nice move. Queen e7. And uh, here white goes d5. Um, and the note says, I'm not sure what I calculated here, <laughs> but but I totally didn't notice that the e5 pawn um, will hang. And yeah, so it's kind of like a blunder because uh, Lost Soul admits, you know, they just didn't realize, well, actually, black can just take this pawn now. And it's not so clear if white is really getting enough um, for the pawn. Black could have also taken with um, the knight. But um, yeah, so in addition to giving feedback on the game, part of this is to also give feedback on you know, the annotations that are submitted. Um, because of course, this is why we encourage people to, to annotate their games is because we believe that this is how you get stronger, pick up new ideas, and eventually play better chess. Um, so a note on the annotations here, and then for some of the other ones as well, it's really important to actually input some variation. So in addition to like writing down your thoughts, like, okay, d5, you know, is said as like not a great move because I didn't actually calculate you know, what happens if I lose the pawn. But then what you should try to consider, at least for a little bit, well, what should white have done instead? And then just try to analyze some variations. Maybe you think rook fe1 is a better move. You can put it on the board, try to figure out how black will play from here. Maybe bishop d3 could be considered. Again, this idea takes followed by uh, d5, I think definitely worth considering. And you can kind of come up with these ideas just by analyzing the position and thinking about, okay, I played d5, what went wrong with this one? Well, e pawn was of course hanging. Uh -huh. So what happens if I take first and then maybe try d5? And you might not come to the right conclusions, but at least the process of starting to analyze the position and looking for these ideas, this is what kind of helps you find these ideas in, uh, in the future. So very, very important to actually input moves, start analyzing a bit and really try to consider um, how the game could have gone differently. Um, so d5, uh, black takes, d takes e6, queen takes e6, and uh, knight d5. And okay, although white lost the pawn, starts playing very energetically, so knight d5 hitting uh, c7. Of course, encouraging black to take so that white can uh, win the light squared bishop, maybe take with the pawn. Uh, black goes bishop d6, and now uh, c5. C5, by the way, great move. Uh, and the note here, it says, um, well, I didn't calculate much here, but I felt if I'm doomed, then then let's just go for it. Because White had lost lost the pawn, so it seems like he's going, uh, he's going all in with this move, uh, C5. But I actually think it's just a strong move, and <laughs> it's a shame that we have to be down a pawn to consider these kinds of, like, crazy moves. I think it happens for a lot of players. Once they're maybe losing or they're down something, then they start looking for like tactics. But this is the kind of move we should be considering uh, with equal material on the board because it's very, very sharp. Um, the point is mainly to open up bishop c4, which we can we can understand that going for uh, tactics on this diagonal. Um, and very important that white sees that, um, well, as we see in the game, bishop takes d5. White finds a very nice move, rook takes d5. Of course, it was also possible to take this one, but this is not the more important piece uh, in the in the position. Um, rook takes d5, I like very much more because white now fights for the light squares. And yeah, white is actually getting huge, uh, huge initiative here. Um, so 
bishop f8. Uh, knight takes e5. At this point, um, yeah, I thought bishop c4 looks very uh, logical. And the notes, Lost Soul says he just wanted to get their pawn back with knight takes e5, which, uh, which I understand. But bishop c4, I got to mention, uh, feels like it's begging to be played, lining up a number of discovered attacks against these pieces. Now, it's true, after king h8, there's not, let's say, such an immediate knockout here for white. Rook takes c5, uh, I think, is probably going to be pretty good, but um, it maybe leads to some some trickiness after knight takes c5 and knight takes f3. Um, but white can just continue building up. This is definitely a position where white is not in a huge hurry to win the pawn back because the peace activity is just so overwhelming. It's hard to imagine black uh, can get away here with only losing a pawn. It feels like black's entire position um, is about to collapse. And now after this move, we, you know, white has uh, a number of more serious threats. Rook takes d7 and, and so on. Um, so yeah, it was very interesting how it, it's out of desperation that white goes for this kind of like crazy attack. Actually just, you know, really strong, um, really strong tactical idea. So takes, takes, bishop f8, knight takes e5. Rook on d5, still untouchable uh, because of bishop c4. So it takes, takes. Uh, queen drops back to c8. Bishop c4 check. King h8. And now uh, rook takes f5. And uh, yeah, after everything clears up, looks like white just has fantastic position here. And uh, game was actually uh, over pretty quickly, but it's uh, yeah already very, very devastating for black here, just like two bishops, king is super weak, especially light squares are going to be uh, under fire very soon. Uh, black played bishop e7, and uh, now nice little combo to finish the game takes, rook f7, and mate next move. So yeah, it ended up being really nice game um, for white uh, after kind of like, uh, kind of, uh, flubbing this part a little bit, like not exactly realizing that e5 uh, can be taken, having a lot better opportunities here, you know, maybe taking first or just building up. Um, but then being forced into like a very dramatic situation, <laughs> white just starts throwing everything at black and it actually kind of uh, ends up working out, which is um, which was kind of interesting. Um, so yeah, thanks uh, for submitting the game Lost Soul. Hopefully that was uh, useful for you. Um, main thing I would say about this game, actually, uh, the fight for the opening center, um, I thought is very important. And so, yeah, I would definitely strongly, uh, look for opportunities to play e4 earlier on. And as we were mentioning, I, these ideas with queen c2 and playing e4, you can do this a lot earlier if your opponent is not fighting for space. And, uh, yeah, and then uh, once we get here, okay, still the battle is only starting, but um, well, in general, having a big space advantage often pays off because your pieces are much more suited for when the position uh, opens up. But uh, yeah, by the way, I'm going to be doing um, two more games. I'm going to be doing NT WAPO, their game submitted, and I'll also be doing... Um, Dean G's game, a game submitted by Dean G. And then I'm going to just keep doing these streams, I think, once a week. So next week I'll do uh, the remaining games from November. Then we'll get through the December games and so on. Uh, why is E4 square so important for black in the King's Indian setup? Well, in general, the center is very, very important. Um, oh, cool. We have two up in the chat. Nice. Um, the center is super important. So in general, in most openings, the, the battle for these squares is often going to be quite critical. When white starts with d4, it's very hard for, for black to challenge white um, on this square. So it's no um, surprise that black's main responses are all about controlling the, the e4 square and the light squares in, in the center. Um, but okay, there's different openings. Like in the King's Indian, for example, I would say... The e4 square is really more important for white to control, and black is often fighting for the dark squares. Um, but obviously, there are many different ways these openings can go, right? So the structure 
can change in so many different ways and then different things become important. So it's hard to give super, super general um, advice. But um, yeah, generally, like when you start with e4, yeah, the comment in the chat is not not too far off. Like you're trying to play d4 and take a full center. And when you start with d4, you're trying to play e4 and take the full center. <laughs> so, so if the opponent is playing b6 or g6, no matter what, you should be happy and you should be reaching this uh, classic pawn structure. Not that it's easy from here. The game, again, is only just beginning, but this is a good way to start. That much I think most people can agree on. In general, this is pretty good. So this game was submitted by um, NT Wapo, who is playing white. And uh, this was a 50 plus 10 uh, online game. So it was a uh, classical time control. And uh, yeah, we get a Smith Mora in this one. A pretty typical Smith Mora um, based on like the development. So black takes, knight takes, knight c6. White goes for kind of usual development scheme, queen e2, rook fd1. This bishop often comes out to f4, rook ac1, and so on. Uh, a6, rook d1, queen c7, bishop f4. And uh, here black plays knight f6. And white goes for it pretty early with e5. Um, yeah, so white mentions here, uh, they missed knight h5. And actually knight h5... Yeah, very strong uh, counter resource for black. The point being that black is hitting the bishop and then from there hitting the queen. So if e takes d6, normally this would be a very powerful tempo, but black has a tempo of their own and manages to actually live in the complication. Knight takes d2, for example, bishop takes, bishop d7, and then this pawn is not super dangerous and black uh, has a really strong unopposed dark squared bishop. So yeah, very nice, uh, very nice resource, and it's it's nice to be aware of these kinds of ideas because okay, next time you have similar position, you you'll know to think twice before playing e5 and making sure you're covered against uh, knight h5, and uh, yeah, that's why you often see players maybe even playing like h3, bishop h2 in these kinds of positions to kind of tuck the bishop away, and then you never have to worry about these um, tempos. So the thematic rook ac1 is suggested in the notes, and I totally agree this would be uh, the move to play for white um, otherwise. And then once again, I would suggest when you're annotating a game, not just to stop at like, okay, here's the one move I should have played instead, but to just try to um, dig a little deeper and see how the game, you know, might play out. Okay, you know, it's hard to predict your opponent's moves, but we can try to make reasonable moves for the opponent. I would imagine maybe they castle at some point, maybe they try some b5 or something, something like this, or developing the bishop, and then maybe just analyzing a couple moves and, and trying to see how the play will develop from here. After all, we are a pawn down, right? And so I, I can definitely guarantee you, you know, you will be seeing a similar position to this in the future. So it will be helpful to kind of analyze it ahead of time to get a sense of some of the ideas. Um, for example, after black castles, one move that I think is quite interesting for white to play here is this move, bishop to b3. And the point, of course, is to line up the rook against uh, black's queen uh, and to set up potential knight d5 ideas. Like if black plays b5 here, then I think knight d5 would already be very, very strong. Opening everything up on the c-file, and then if takes, takes. Seems like black is going to have to give the piece back, but okay, position is nicely opening up for white. White might also be uh, just winning their pawn back uh, in the position as well. And yeah, clear that white just has like uh, a ton of pressure here. Um, now, bishop b3, not the kind of move, you know, you would necessarily find uh, during the game. But if you come up with this idea during the analysis, then you analyze it a bit and, you know, kind of get a sense of how it's working. Then you're much, much more likely to kind of remember this pattern uh, for uh, the future. So this one you get for free, but uh, yeah, important to analyze these lines on, on your own as well. So you can try to, because it's doing the work that really helps you in, in the long run, right? You might analyze like five different variations and then see one idea here, one idea here, and uh, eventually it all kind of adds up and gets stored uh, deep in your, in your pattern uh, recognition. Um, okay, so game continues E5. And uh, black misses knight h5, takes on e5, knight takes e5, and now very bold move castles. But um, yeah, I, I feel like this might have been 
um, well, it might have been necessary for black because white is um, very, very active here and threatening stuff like knight g6. Um, but it's hard to, hard to imagine black has time for a move like queen to b6 and or trying to just get out because white still has a lot of tempos on uh, this queen. So I can understand castles here. And uh, now white doesn't have like knight takes c6, for example, because then just queen takes. Um, but white does have knight g6, defending the bishop and hitting the rook. Now black plays e5. Maybe this was their idea when they castled. Uh, I'm not really sure. Um, but very, very cool idea. Unfortunately, it doesn't totally work out. Um, the point is if white takes the rook, then e takes f4 and the knight is trapped. So this, this is kind of nice for black. Um, and black is going to have two pieces for the rook. Very nice kind of material imbalance and white can't really do anything with the, the lean development. I think black is just better here. Um, but okay, e5, white just plays knight takes e5. And now white has won the pawn back and still has a pretty nice initiative. And it's a symmetrical position. You know, no one, like all the pawns are basically the same. Okay, black has a6 in. Uh, no one has any particular weaknesses. But the main way to evaluate these positions is to just look at the development. And it's very clear that white is ahead in development. Rooks are connected. We also have a very annoying bishop pointed at this queen on c7. And uh, yeah, now knight g6 is a threat again. So it just feels like a very, very difficult position for black. And uh, it feels like it's already uh, quite bad. So takes, takes, queen c5, bishop d4, uh, queen c7, and rook a c1, just playing uh, simple chess. And it, yeah, it's quite tough for black because, okay, now white has ideas of uh, discovered attacks against the queen, like knight b5, for example, and then bishop takes f7 check. It's a big problem. Um, so on b5, white can probably just take this one. This bishop on e7 is hanging, so black can't just tuck the queen away. So yeah, very, very tough position. Um, black played knight g4. Now just g3, simple defense. Uh, bishop c5. And uh, knight d5, nice little tempo. And yeah, white's initiative, I mean, it kind of like plays itself. Queen d6, takes, takes. And uh, now the kind of the tactic we were uh, alluding to earlier, knight f6 check. Uh, very nicely spotted. So the point is to open up this one. And uh, yeah, if black takes either way, then white is taking on f7 and winning the queen for uh, two pieces. And yeah, just hopeless for black. Um, so essentially winning the game, black played king h8, and now white takes on g4. And uh, I believe this was actually the reason why uh, NT Wapo submitted the game. They mentioned in their notes that they were able to win a piece, but then had a really, really hard time converting the position after winning the piece. Um, especially once we get into uh, this endgame. In fact, to quote, um, they said, in the heat of battle, it felt like carving an umbrella with a toothpick, which, yeah, is is pretty tough. <laughs> nice uh, squid game reference there. So let's talk a little bit about how to convert uh, this kind of position, because I had some thoughts uh, on the, uh, the technical phase of this game. And it seems like it should be uh, simple, and I think in, in most cases it is. So it'll be interesting to analyze a bit why white um, struggled. Um, because it does feel like just clean extra piece should be very easy, very smooth conversion. Um, black shouldn't be given any chances to survive whatsoever, especially at this level, like 17, 1800. We definitely don't want to be letting the opponents off the hook ever when we're up a piece. Um, so... Yeah, let's let's see uh, what happens here. Now, of course, there are always psychological elements, especially when you're playing a competitive game. It might be an important game. It might be a team tournament. You might be playing for a prize. That always adds some kind of like mental pressure. But um, that aside, in general, we still should be able to kind of like keep our keep our cool, especially because this is just such an overwhelming advantage. We're not talking about like nursing a small advantage to victory. This is like you know, game over, resignable position, we should just be able to convert it 10 times out of 10. So let's see what happened. So um, rook c8 played, and, and right away this move gave me kind of a funny feeling because of course we do want to be trading pieces, 
uh, in general when we're ahead. And if white could just trade off all the rooks, that would simplify the task. Um, but this one does kind of feel like we, we're acquiescing a little bit, right? If we just forget about being a piece up, if we think about this from like a normal strategic sense, white's rook on c1 is very active, black's rook on f8 is not active, white should not really be interested in trading off our active rook for the opponent's passive rook. So we're only doing this because, okay, we're just trying to trade pieces off and simplify, but at the same time, it's also not really necessary to kind of give this advantage up, right? It feels like a already a very, very minor, but maybe, you know, slowly becomes more and more significant type of uh, concession. So I was thinking about this position, of course, you know, many moves you can make, you can play like b4, like, okay, this move makes sense, kind of fixing the weakness, you could try to get the king in. Um, to me, rook c6 made some sense just to activate the rook, maybe tie black down to this pawn. And then of course, whenever you want to, you can double up. You can always play rook c8 later. You can always take over the eighth rank or the seventh rank, um, whatever you wanna do. In many cases, it's not even that, yeah, we wanna take the eighth rank, but rather we'd rather take the seventh rank so we can put pressure on f7, put pressure on uh, the queen side, and then it's very, very simple. So maybe there's something to be said about not just, um, you know, not begging your opponent for a trade when you, you can just kind of play the position and just activate your pieces normally. Anyway, f6 takes, takes, uh, rook e1, okay, threatening mate, black uh, drops back, king f3, uh, rook d8, now we drop back knight e4. This move was definitely possible as well, rook e6, just kind of like a nice little domination. The rook is, of course, supporting the knight, and everything is kind of untouchable in white's setup. Black can't play king f7. Black is just kind of paralyzed. White can bring the king in. White can drop the knight back and go after the queen side. Feels like it would be very, very uh, straightforward here. Um, so I also got the sense that white was trying to win this game, let's say, without really uh, calculating anything, which is a very natural uh, kind of feeling. And I think we've all, a lot of us have probably experienced this uh, type of thing where it's like, okay, I'm completely winning. I should be able to just win like move by move, just like slowly improve my position, not have to calculate anything. But again, kind of a small concession, right? Sometimes you can make your life a lot easier just by making, let's say, slightly uh, uh, slightly challenging move like rookie six. Okay, you have to make sure that your pieces aren't going to get forked or anything like this. But once you see it and you start evaluating, you can see, okay, it's definitely a good place for the rook. Um, so yeah, knight c5, rook d5, check, knight f4, rook d2. And the nice thing is, okay, white isn't in any particular rush. Uh, we played a3 here. Not really sure why. Seems like that just encourages black to uh, to trade pawns. But yeah, feels like white's not just not sure what to do. At this point, the plan is to get your king in. Just start inching your king and your rook over to the queen side. I think this would be the easiest way to convert uh, because essentially, okay, we have an extra piece. We have to use it. And the way you use an extra piece is you have to attack something. So probably the easiest thing to target is uh, going after the queen side pawns. Maybe rook c2 and going after them uh, this way would also, would also make sense. Um, but a3, g5, b4, and uh, rook e4, rook d3 check. Uh, and here, kind of a blunder, knight e3, because now black goes rook b3, and all of a sudden there's no way to defend this one. And white's still white's still winning uh, by by wide margin, but all of a sudden it's like, <laughs> what's what's happened? All of a sudden we've allowed counterplay. So at this point, it's already um, it feels like from a technical standpoint, yeah, we've we haven't done a great job here. Um, of course, this was just just a blunder. White should have. And just played rook e3 check, and then, okay, uh, this is mentioned in the notes, the rook come to b3, and white is um, still very much in control and should slowly pick up the pawn, win the game, and uh, have have no issues. So, yeah, knight e3, I think, just not realizing uh, the, the annoyance of this move, and we're not able to defend the pawn. Like, if white could play knight c4, then okay, everything is, is uh, totally fine still for white, but yeah, knight is pinned, and uh, now it starts to get tricky. Now this b-pawn is like uh, causing a bit of a headache, so we have to be um, really, really careful here. Uh, h4, 
And T. Whopper writes in the notes that uh, the side with the piece up, you shouldn't be exchanging pawns here. So yeah, that, that's correct. So in spirit, h4 is not really what we want to be doing. Uh, instead, I would suggest um, just unpinning and then finding a way to, to activate the knight. Uh, and then the knight and rook should be able to pick up the pawn. Um, but uh, anyway, white is still very much winning here. It's just a little bit uh, trickier, but h4 now, and we see the problem. Like, okay, black is trading even more pawns. Knight d2, takes, takes, king e3, and all of a sudden we're just down to one pawn, which is like very, very scary, and black is just kind of slowly and slowly achieving their dream of, of trading the pawns off. Um, even here, though, it still is very much a win for white, as long as everything is under control. The king supports the knight, the knight is able to uh, uh, defend against the pawn, and of course, white's rook is also very active. Um, so h3, this pawn doesn't really end up going very far. Rook a2, okay, nice trick, rook a3 check, but white is able to play rook takes b4. And it's a nice construction white ended up here because, um, or white ended up with here because if black had played b3, for example, which also looks natural, uh, then white goes rook takes h3. And the knight kind of nicely defends, uh, uh, hits the pawn, also defends uh, b1 square, so it's difficult for, for black to, even though it looks like black's pawn is advancing, black can even uh, try this move, like playing for rook c3 check, but then white has king d3, white can also bring the rook back, the knight is controlling b1, and so black's pawn is going to have, the, the pawn's not going anywhere, the king, rook, knight can, can just corral it very, very easily, and then this pawn is still going to be uh, pretty safe. So, even after all that, not a ton of upside for black, but anyway, rook a2, white takes this one, king g6, knight f3, and now, okay, everything is very closely bundled up on the uh, the king side, so white should be able um, to pick up this pawn. So king g3, h2, <laughs> like makes it a little tricky, but rook b1, white is very much uh, still in time here. Uh, king g2, and finally gets the pawn. And okay, now it would feel like, all right, now it should be done. No more adventures, no more tricks, no more pawns. <laughs> like, white should be able to convert, but surprisingly, black uh, actually does make uh, the draw by, by a miracle. Um, so let me show you guys uh, what happened. Essentially, white tries to start making progress, but this king... Uh, creeps in, king e3, and king g2, and all of a sudden the uh, pawn on f2 is under attack, and knight on g3 is also possibly hanging, so you can't just start advancing uh, the pawn. And and just like that, like just so quickly, black is actually uh, drawing this one, because white can't hold on to the pawn. Um, now in the notes, uh, white mentions that what they had kind of were relying on was rook g4, which is played in the game. The point being rook takes f2, knight e4 check. And uh, and here white does win. In fact, uh, king h3, knight takes f2, right? Defends the rook and white is winning. Um, but, uh, okay, uh, this one is kind of a funny <laughs> try, but there's king takes. Uh, the problem is rook f3 check, king d4. And again, rook takes f2, knight e4 check. White wins, because white takes the rook and defends uh, on g4. Um, but the issue, of course, black can just take with the king. So it ends up being just kind of simple miscalculation. Uh, I think black could have also played this move, king h3, and then hitting the rook and just taking the f2 pawn next. And so this is not the kind of thing where we want to be like calculating like two, three moves and making sure that we're holding on to the pawn with tactics. We should be able to defend this pawn uh, you know, quite uh, quite simply. At this point, we should be able to win without using uh, too many tactics. So, yeah, very surprising that all this happened. One one thing I can definitely say at this point, with uh, Black having played Rook F8 check, I probably would have just put the King on G2. Um, just something it makes sense to me to try to fight against the enemy King. So we want to bring our King to G3, take the opposition, and then 
in theory, just conceptually, the way you kind of convert this is you just have to push the king backwards, right? So it is actually very much like a king and rook versus king checkmate, where you're just trying to slowly march uh, black's king backwards, slowly advance the pawn, and white should be able to do it with the, the king and, of course, extra knight and, and pawn. Um, so, um, yeah, I guess one moment where I definitely would have improved white's play, maybe I would have just started with this one here. And the point is we just want to give a check to the black king, and if the black king is not active, then we, of course, don't have to worry about it. And if black plays like rook a5, just to slow it down, then, okay, this rook is not going to be bothering us now. White can start maneuvering the knight, maybe knight e3, king g3, f4, and everything starts moving. And as long as we keep the knight next to the king, yeah, there's shouldn't be a way for black uh, to be able to ever get to our pawn. Um, so, yeah, it was very surprising that the king was able to uh, to get in. This was, okay, the last chance where, yeah, white can still play like king f1 or something, and it's passive, but white is still uh, totally winning here, um, just to not let the king super, super active. Um, so, yeah. And then, to okay, my shock once again, black ended up winning the pawn. And gets into a drawn endgame, rook and knight versus rook. And in fact, this one isn't uh, particularly difficult to uh, to hold either. But ends up blundering. Knight c3, rook f4 check, king e3. And uh, that was game over. Um, so basically, black was holding up until the last move, rook f4 check. After any move, like rook f8, for example, just bringing the rook to the distance... Or generally wants to go because it want to give it want, wants to give checks from very far away. What rooks don't like to do is give checks from up close because then they get immediately hit. You know they get countered with uh, the king walking forward. Um, but yeah, after any move like rook f8, black is holding this one uh, very very easily. I mean, even though it looks like oh white is making a lot of progress, it's really hard to actually set up a mate in in these kinds of um, positions. Because it's just the way that the king and the knight, they kind of stumble over each other. Notice how here the knight can't move because it's pinned. But if the king moves out of the way, then the rook gives a check. And the knight has no comfortable way of like blocking the check. The king has to go back and yeah, the rook can just go back to pinning the knight. And very, very hard for white to, uh, to actually win this. Um, so a little bit fortunate in the end, but okay, uh, you know, a, a win is a win. <laughs> White was winning for most of the game, so it's kind of justified in the end. Um, very unfortunate blunder from Black's point of view. Probably time trouble with a rook f4 check. Um, very typical, like when we're, we don't have a lot of time, even with 10 second increment, to just kind of like give the first check we see. But yeah, we have to be careful because this is, this is like one of the few ways you can actually end up losing this end game when you... Uh, fall into a trick like this where okay it's a double attack against your rook and against the uh the king um so yeah definitely a struggle there with uh with the technique um long story short it, it felt like just the whole time white was never really sure how to convert the position like what what to do and just kind of staying put staying put and just hoping that you know they could trade rooks at one point um, but uh, no, here at this point, I think we need to be like a little bit more, um, a little bit more productive, like trying to achieve something. And then once we get down to just having one pawn, this is the point where you have to be really, really uh, precise. You cannot afford to to wing it or, or take it easy at all. You have to make sure that, yeah, the pawn is advancing and we're not losing it. Um, yeah. So what to do to improve in the end game? That's a good question. I mean. Uh, in terms of the the mindset, I think you kind of want to make sure you're focusing still on like peace activity. So just because we're up a piece doesn't mean we just you know play passively and make sure everything is defended. We should use our extra piece and and show the value of having an extra knight in the position because it can attack uh, a lot more stuff. Um, in terms of just improving endgame play in general, well, lots of great books out there, of course, endgame strategy. Uh, by Sharashevsky is a classic. Mastering Endgame Strategy by Helstein is also super, super good. Um, lots of great 
in-game books out there with lots of good examples on like uh, practical in-game uh, play. Um, okay, hopefully that helps. Thanks for submitting the game. Uh, definitely, I think, uh, should be a useful one. Um, okay, last game for today is going to be from uh, Dean G, who submitted this game. Uh, that was actually OTB game at the Mechanics Club. And this was a uh, game in 120, so two hour game with a five second delay. And uh, Dean's opponent here is rated, he mentioned uh, 1600 OTB, about 1900 online. Dean, I think, is about 1,600, 1,700 online. Uh, Chess.com, I think Lee Chess is a bit higher. I believe his OTB rating, I'm not sure, is a little bit lower than 1,600. But anyway, Dean is playing higher rated opponent. Uh, higher rated opponent here. Okay, uh, so this game was a Karo Khan. And uh, I should also mention that Dean is playing uh, a third grader. So young kid, probably improving, probably underrated. Yeah, <laughs> tough opponent. But anyway, we got Karo Khan, E5, and uh, C5. And, and Dean writes he was not expecting this one because mainly, you know, most players uh, will play Bishop F5 here. But um, C5 uh, is kind of, I guess, the yeah second most common move. Definitely a very serious line as well. Maybe not the main line, but like as close as you can get um, because, yeah, tons and tons of games here. Um, question on the last game, was there any way why could have given up the knight near the end to get a winning uh, rook and pawn end game. I think that maybe was possible. I didn't check too carefully, but I know what you mean, Foos Chess. Like, if black's king was, like, cut off and then white has this, like, yeah, extra f pawn, there definitely could be cases like that. Um, but not... Um, not once black played king to g2, if you remember, or go back to that position... Um, once black gets king g2 in, uh, white's just like losing the pawn there. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I think yeah you could try something, but uh, no, it doesn't seem to doesn't seem to work. But before all that happens, then then maybe there is some some chances for white. Um, okay, so c5, and yeah, this move is uh, quite interesting for black because black is just kind of um, creating pressure against the center, even at the cost of the tempo. But uh, the point is that if white plays c3, then black gets to like develop the bishop, and it is very much worth it for black to uh, spend an extra tempo, but get an advanced French where the bishop is outside the pawn chain. So that's kind of the upside here for black. Um, but a lot of players will just go dc5 here, as Dean does in uh, the game, and I think this is the still the main line today. Uh, e6, black tries to win the pawn back. And, uh, and bishop e3. Okay, and here Dean writes, um, I was already out of prep since I, I forgot what the right plan was here. Um, I thought for 10 minutes and could only muster up bishop e3, which uh, I didn't think was right. And I find it very hard to calculate concretely in opening positions where there's a lot of possibilities. And yeah, that's, that's very true. And when you're in the opening, it's hard to like calculate stuff because there's just like a million options for both sides. And it's very hard to, to find your, your footing. And and this is a problem I, I feel like I see a lot of players get into where, um, you know, they know the move is D takes C5, even though, like, if you just show this position to someone for the first time, they probably wouldn't play DC, you know, they'd probably play like C3 or Knight F3, just kind of like developing normally, right? Maybe C3, I think, most natural move. Um, but it's like, White knows the move is DC5. He knows this is the theory move, so he plays it. Then Black goes E6. But white doesn't really know the position that well, so now he's like thinking on his own. But then why take on c5 if you're not if you're not sure how to follow up? So this is the struggle that I think a lot of players have with the opening. Like they're studying some lines, they're learning some stuff, but then you get yourself into a position that's like a very sharp, dynamic position without really knowing what you're doing, just because you think that's what you're supposed to play. It's a very dangerous recipe. And here white gets in trouble uh, very very quickly because he starts you know, now playing on his own, but there's maybe a very specific way that we're supposed to follow up on, on DC5. So you have to be careful. You need to, like, commit one way or the other. Are you going to, like, learn theory and really try to follow the main lines? In that case, you really have to know what you're doing, and it's not enough just to, like, know one move. You have to kind of know your follow-up, your setup, where the pieces go, at least, at least where you're putting the pieces. Like, 
knight f3, bishop d3, a3, b4, things like that. Um, or, okay, do you want to just play natural chess, just focus on development? Well, then that's absolutely fine. But then, yeah, we got we to gotta follow it up. So dc, e6, bishop e3, and uh, now black goes knight e7, um, heading for knight f5, uh, f4, which basically just ends up being a little bit too overextending, uh, knight f5, and now bishop uh, f2. So uh, at this point, black ends up making a mistake with queen a5 check. I think probably should have played like knight d7 here and just gone after the pawn. And then black gets a very reasonable French where it feels like white is a little, a little bit behind, but should still be okay, like knight f3, bishop d3. In terms of the opening, by the way, I think there's different ways to play this. I think a3 is a move here that uh, Dean mentions um, that makes sense. And then after bishop takes c5, white has some options here. You can either play like knight f3 first, then like bishop d3, b4, bishop b2, castles, and, and then white gets kind of a, a pretty healthy setup. This knight can go to d2, not to block the bishop. Um, or white can start with queen g4 first. Black usually goes knight e7. It's kind of dangerous to take this pawn. Um, and then I think instead white typically just develops normally again. Knight f3, bishop d3, b4, and... Um, the difference is that white's queen is a little bit more active uh, on on g4. So you can also go this, but uh, do this, but it's a little bit more aggressive. I think both ways are playable. Um, is there? Uh, can you ever play f4 in these positions? Sometimes you you can. I mean, it's a very common move in like a lot of French type of positions. But from what I've seen, I'm not a huge expert in this line. But from what I've seen, typically white is playing without to keep this bishop open and, and keep chances uh, to play like bishop g5, bishop f4. And basically the, the pawn on e5 can be defended with pieces. And so white instead uh, just develops and uh, yeah, focuses on keeping the bishop uh, open. But that is kind of a, a quirk of, of this variation. Um, anyway, so we get uh, f4, knight f5, bishop f2. And uh, like I mentioned, I think black should just go knight d7 here. Um, but we actually get a very interesting moment, queen a5 check. And uh, Dean writes, you know, he thought about queen d2, but uh, he ends up uh, skipping a beat <laughs> in his calculation, which has happened to, to many of us. And basically the way his he thought was queen d2, black takes, white takes, and then queen takes c5. And then, okay, losing the pawn anyway. Uh, of course, not realizing that actually, wait, queen on a5 is uh, is hanging. So black doesn't have time for bishop takes c5. And in fact, here, black doesn't uh, win the pawn back. Instead, white is actually keeping this one. So kind of funny case of like mutual blindness where black blunders with queen a5, um, thinking they're going to get the pawn back. And white kind of believes them and plays c3. But queen d2 was, uh, of course... Um, actually just uh, a killer refutation. And uh, yeah, this kind of blunder happens sometimes when we're like calculating, I think, a little bit uh, too quickly or if our calculation isn't smooth. Because you might, your brain might be thinking like, like, oh, maybe they can take or maybe they take here first uh, and then they take on c5 and then you realize, oh wait, if they take here first and they can't take on c5, so they'll probably just take on c5. And then you forget the whole time that this queen on a5 is hanging. So you kind of like skip around without really absorbing what's what's happening uh, in the position. So kind of uh, interesting miss here. And black also blunders because, uh, well, presumably black played this thinking they're, they're getting the pawn back. Um, but yeah, after queen d2, it would actually be, well, black would have to take, white can take with the knight, and then, yeah, black is not actually going to win this pawn back so easily. And it's not like a, I don't think it's like it's decisive advantage for white, because this pawn is kind of weak, but okay, white is now very much, uh, in charge here. Uh, so instead we see c3, bishop c5, now b4 is not in time, because bishop takes f2 is with check, and so this move would just be weakening, uh, so white trades. Queen takes, and uh, and now bishop d3. And uh, yeah, allowing this check, queen e3, knight e2, it feels like everything is covered, um, but then black plays knight h4. And this move actually turns out to be surprisingly 
annoying for white because black hits the g2 pawn uh, you know g3 knight f3 check is super scary and white can defend the pawn but only by giving up uh, their castling rights so very annoying move actually knight h4 when i first saw this game i thought i felt like okay it can't be too bad because like i mean black is only attacking with two pieces how could white be in some serious danger here but it is very annoying to i mean you have to forfeit your castling right and that's that's the bigger issue so this ends up not working out i guess white should have uh, played like something like queen d2 here uh to to stop this one but yeah a little bit uh surprising king f1 is played castles knight a3 um, though it still feels like white's position is uh, salvageable if black doesn't follow up too actively. And that is kind of what happens here. Black plays bishop d7. Okay, very natural move, just like trying to get the bishop out. But this one ends up being a little bit too slow. Um, definitely black should have just played the immediate f6. And if we look at it from black's point of view, I mean, I think it, it kind of feels apparent, right? Like rook is on the f-file, the king is on f1 f6 is a thematic move in the French as it is. This one is like kind of screaming to be played. When it's not played, when black goes bishop d7, now white gets time. Knight c2 hits the queen. Uh, black played queen b6. And uh, yeah, here white could have taken the time to actually secure the king with g3. Um, so this was another very, very interesting moment. Uh, maybe one of the more instructive ones in the game. So Dean writes you know, he didn't want to play g3 because he wanted to keep uh, his chances alive of bishop takes h7. And so what he means is like he's hoping for some kind of tactic like knight d4, bishop takes h7 check, king takes queen h5, uh, winning a pawn. So he goes b3 here first to defend the b pawn. This one might not have been necessary because queen takes b2, rook b1 anyway. White gets, you know, white gets some activity on the b file. But okay, b3, we spend the tempo, we weaken the c3 square. Knight c6, again, I think black should be playing f6 immediately. Knight d4, and uh, and now white is getting, you know, this trick, or at least he's threatening this trick that he's hoping for. Bishop takes h7, queen h5 check. Um, but even here, let's say black just allows white to get it. Let's say rook c8, black just totally misses and blunders it. White plays takes, takes queen h5, king g8, takes. White is one upon. But even here, black plays f6, and, uh, and who would you rather be in this position, right? I don't think we want to take white here with the king on f1, rook's disconnected, the f-file opening up. So even here, after all this, white got all of their dreams uh, coming true. Bishop takes h7, they won a pawn. White's position is still very much uh, worse here, and, and white isn't just huge, huge danger. This bishop doesn't look like much, but eventually it's going to open up and this king on f1 is uh, is going to pay the price. So this was definitely, I think, a case where Jesse would say pawns are not people. And uh, yeah, rather than playing all these moves just to win this one pawn, definitely white needed to just focus on securing the king. Because white could play g3 here, force uh, black's knight backwards, put the king on g2, and white's position is instantly much better compared to before. Now at least the king makes sense. The rook can get into the game. And it's all about the pieces. So this was definitely what white needed to uh, uh, to be playing for. Um, and so, yeah, b3 is, is slow. Knight c6. Once again, g3 had to be played here. And from black's point of view, f6 <laughs> had to be played here just to create as much counterplay as possible. Because once white plays g3 and king g2, then f6 is no longer that dangerous. White can take on g6, white can take on f6. The king on g2 is a lot, lot safer. So this one tempo, I think, ends up making uh, a really, really serious difference. Um, as it turns out, uh, black does end up playing f6 in time. And now, now once again, the position becomes really, really uh, difficult for white. So uh, it takes, oh, and at this point, you know, Dean can go for bishop takes h7, but realizes that, yeah, it's not exactly an opening of the position that uh, white is going to be happy with, just kind of collapsing. And yeah, we get into to big, big trouble here. Um, so takes, takes, knight d4 is played, uh, 
bishop d7. And um, yeah, Dean points out like fe5, I think, is shown by the engine. Knight takes e6, rook f6. But uh, yeah, this is kind of like, yeah, typical engine stuff where it, it doesn't feel that natural. And yeah, I agree with both Dean and his opponent that, okay, bishop d7 um, makes sense. And uh, now white takes on f6. The engine points out one last chance for white, I think, to uh, defend the position with queen e1. But again, sometimes the engine just shows moves that are like, you know, you just didn't even consider during the game. And uh, usually it means that the move is not that natural. <laughs> if it was a natural move, you probably would have um, considered it. Um, but okay, very, very smart move, uh, queen e1. I just wanted to show, because it is kind of nice. You hit the knight, you defend um, the e5 pawn as well, and you cover uh, c3. But um, yeah, optically, it still feels like white would be in, in trouble here. So I don't think the engine's uh, uh, choices, although kind of interesting, not super relevant here. The, the point is that white has been in trouble for a long time and just needed to secure the king um, much, much sooner. Instead, we get ef6. Rook takes f6, g3, now e5, nice move from black, just breaking everything open. Um, white goes for takes, I mean, hard to suggest moves because, yeah, the position is collapsing and uh, black's pieces are, of course, much more active here. But white tries this one, queen h5, unfortunately black has rook h6 takes a uh, game gets gets very sharp but essentially black keeps control and uh we end up getting going into the end game actually black has won a piece white sac ended up sacrificing a piece with bishop takes h7 in case that wasn't clear um but okay white's position is very difficult so i i, I definitely don't blame white for going for complications here gets a couple pawns um, but black is able to kind of stabilize and uh, yeah eventually we trade down into uh, this endgame. Um, now, Dean was asking in his notes whether he could have uh, defended this one better. Yeah, I took a look at this one and really tough to find a moment where White could have play, um, really done like a lot more. I'll kind of show you guys how the game um, progressed. Uh, Black puts the bishop on c6, rook e3. You could make an argument, maybe it's better not to trade rooks, but um, it, it really doesn't change the evaluation of the position one way or another. Black is very much in control and should win if they kind of uh, take their time and, and uh, proceed patiently. Um, I think a lot of players might be inclined to just keep the rook on the board and maybe hope for more counterplay this way. So maybe this would be the one thing um, that I would suggest. In a lot of cases, when you simplify the position like this, trading off rooks, sometimes it does make it easier for the opponent to convert it. So you have to be really careful before trading off um, the rooks. Um, because looking at this position, you know, the bishop is very strong, and even though white has two pawns, they're not really far advanced, they're not super dangerous, and they're not even pass pawns, right? White still has some work to do before actually making a pass pawn in the position. So definitely black has uh, uh, enough to, to win here. Um, but let's see how the game progressed. And uh, I like the way black played it. They uh, take their time. They don't really rush and, and do a whole lot. And they actually don't need to um, because they can just slowly improve the position. If white starts advancing too quickly, then those pawns will quickly get kind of rounded up and, and taken. So, you know, if g5 here, then king f5, for example, and, and black will slowly just pick up all the pawns. So white has to be uh, very, very careful about advancing stuff, but uh, hard to make progress here. King g5, black keeps shuffling, but now black kind of finds the right, the right plan here. King d5, king e4. Um, so g5 is played, king e4, and yeah, now it's uh now it's kind of lost. And I like the switch back because if black's king goes for like b3, then okay, black has to be careful that white's pawns don't get like <laughs> don't create some counterplay. And they will. The, the three pawns against one, they they will create some serious counterplay. So you have to be uh, kind of using the king in a very active way and also making sure that the opponent's pawns don't go anywhere. Um, but I didn't really see any chances for white to um, 
to pose a lot of problems. It could try king g5 here again, but then king e4, and uh, slowly white kind of um, runs out of moves, and yeah, black will be able to uh, to pick up these pawns. Um, so g5, king f5, g6, and then uh, bishop takes g6. Not necessary, but actually a very clean way to, to finish the game from black. So I did kind of like this one, because take takes, king takes f4, and now black sees that there's no way for white to hold on to the g6 pawn, giving black a very trivial king and pawn endgame, um, where black just gets outside pass pawn and wins by now running the king over to the uh, queen side. So overall, I felt like actually very good technique for black. Like maybe black could have done stuff a little bit quicker, but didn't really give white any chances as far as I could see. And, uh, and then finds very smooth way to kind of simplify and convert the position. Like again, didn't have to give up the bishop, but this is just 100% a winning endgame. So I actually think it was uh, a pretty wise choice on behalf of the uh, opponent. So yeah, nice conversion, especially considering black was apparently a uh, third grader. So not a very um, old <laughs> player, pretty young player, right? But showing some real nice maturity in the end game. Um, okay, Dean, hopefully uh, that helps a lot of moments, I think, in the middle game where uh, maybe the mindset, I think, could have been different, especially in terms of, you know, what we're playing for with the king on f1. We got to try to improve the king rather than uh, just playing for a, a possible tactic just to win the pawn. Once again, pawns are not people. It's all about the, the pieces and the king, of course, and making sure that your pieces are kind of maximizing their value in the uh, position. Um, okay, guys, that's going to do it for uh, this game. Hopefully that was uh, instructive. Um, and that's going to be the final game for today's stream. Um, and yeah, I'm going to continue doing these streams, I think, once a week. So next week I'll do a couple more games uh, left over from uh, November, and then we'll go into December's games and uh, so on. But yeah, lots of cool games submitted. I always like uh, going through these and finding instructive lessons for, uh, for everyone.